Um, thank you so much uh, for that wonderful introduction and thank you for the, to the Centre for Arts and Society and to Paul Issa and all the people who've uh, worked to bring me here today. Uh, before I begin, I just want to ask, do uh, people prefer that we have both screens on? Is that going to be easier on this side to see or is one screen too confusing with both? Any preference? Okay, so if this is alright, I'll just go ahead with this. Okay. So the annual Cuban Hip Hop Festival was started in June 1995 by an association of rappers known as Grupo Uno. They worked on a shoestring budget to make the concerts happen, sometimes without electricity, dependent on an ailing sound system or resources donated from friends and neighbours. The organisers of the Hip Hop Festival collaborated with the Black August Hip Hop Collective here in the United States to bring American rappers out to the festivals. In 1998, Most Def, Talib Kweli, DJ High Tech and Dead Prez performed at the festival and Common made an appearance at the 1999 festival. When Dead Prez rapped, I'm an African, I'm an African, in front of a crowd of thousands at the festival, the amphitheatre resounded with the thundering response of the Cuban audience chanting back the words. It was pan-Africanism in motion. But the politics didn't always translate. Unaware of the implications of what he was about to do, rapper M1 pulled out a dollar bill on stage and began to burn it with a cigarette lighter, an act considered illegal and a defacement of property in the United States. Because of this dollar, the children in my country are dying for crack or for drugs or for bling bling. The audience went wild. How could somebody be burning a precious dollar bill? Oh yeah, no, give me that dollar. I can buy some bread or some French fries, people in the audience cried out. Then he began to burn a $10 bill. No, stop, screamed the audience. What is that crazy guy doing? I could feed my whole family for a month with that. One member of the American delegation, Raquel Rivera, was translating, explaining to the baffled audience that in America, black people are dying because of the dollar bill. But here in Cuba, shouted one person half seriously, people are dying of hunger. In my talk today, I want to consider the questions. Can hip hop, a subculture that includes rapping, b-boying, DJing, beat making and graffiti writing, forge political alliances between marginalized and Afro-descendant people across the world? Is there such a thing as a global hip hop generation and could it act politically? This talk draws from my larger work, a book entitled Close to the Edge, In Search of the Global Hip Hop Generation, recently released by Verso Books. The book is based on my experience in four cities, Havana, Chicago, Sydney and Caracas, over a period of 11 years. In some ways, my search for a global hip hop generation traced the paths that hip hop itself had traversed across the globe. The first rap song to go global was Sugar Hill Gang's 1979 hit, Rapper's Delight. In Cuba, the song was called Apeneje because nobody could make any sense of the lyrics. Likewise, in Venezuela, kids were blown away by the style of rhyming and the catchy beat, but it was so long and incomprehensible that it was rebaptized La Cotorra, which is the term for a pompous and long-winded speech. Other replicas surfaced across the globe from Jamaica to Brazil and Germany, where it was called Rapper's Deutsch. As the first rap song to go global, Rapper's Delight embodied the mix of fascination and incomprehension that would accompany the spread of early rap. By the early 1980s, the global circulation of hip hop through the music industry was being paralleled by the endeavors of hip hop ambassadors like Africa, Bam Africa Bambara. Bambara wanted to spread a message of black brotherhood and unity through his organization, the Universal Zulu Nation. In April 1982, Bambara's single, Planet Rock, was an anthem for this nascent movement that was producing chapters across the city. Bambada's mission to forge a global hip-hop community echoed the aspirations of Pan-Africanist Marcus Garvey. His mission was taken up by three generations to come. Chuck D of Public Enemy took his vision of a black planet around the globe in the late 1980s, paying visits to local communities while on foreign tours. The Black August Hip Hop Collective was formed in the, light, in the late 1990s to draw connections between radical black activism and hip-hop culture. They organized exchanges between militant rappers in the US, Cuba, and South Africa. And the new millennium was the era of diasporic rappers who forged a politics of global solidarity from within the heart of empire. These hip hop ambassadors had their counterparts among intellectuals such as Paul Gilroy, who had proposed the concept of the Black Atlantic as a space of exchange, belonging, and identity among Afro diasporic communities that surpassed, surpassed national boundaries. Music held a privileged place in the Black Atlantic unseating the primacy of language and writing as expressive forms. But blackness did not always have to be the element connecting marginalized communities. 
George Lipset saw Planet Rock as part of an international dialogue built on the imagination of the urban poor around the world who were suffering from the effects of global austerity policies imposed by transnational capital. Another set of scholars have used, more recently used the trope of the, trope of the global hip-hop nation to express a diffusion of hip-hop and its social location as a universal cultural space. All of these scholars saw the potential of the market for carrying important political ideas between cultures. My own quest mirrors the project of these ambassadors and scholars. As I traveled the globe in search of this elusive community, I saw the ways that hip hop was being integrated into the arsenal, repertoire, and landscape of urban youth. Yet the more I probed, the more I became aware of the disconnect between localized expressions of hip hop. If there was something that held them together, it was being lost in a haze of misunderstandings, cultural assumptions, and mixed signals. My own projected imaginings and desires were not being met with the enthusiasm that I would have expected. The easy fraternity of a hip-hop globe was in danger of being rejected as a fantasy, concocted and imposed from the West and rejected by the rest. The same year as Planet Rock was re released, another single called The Message came out. It was credited to Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five. Where Planet Rock preached universal brotherhood and transcendence, The Message was an edgy take on ghetto life from the heart of Reagan's America. Where Bombarda envisaged a universal consciousness, the message was concerned with the specifics of everyday survival in the ghetto. At the same time, the message came to represent a profound counterforce in global hip-hop history, and it offered a lesson that could not be ignored. This local specificity emerged as key in the global spread of hip-hop. Hip-hop was shaping a language that allowed young people to negotiate a political voice for themselves in their societies. As I discovered through my travels, the genesis of hip-hop in each case was highly dependent on the histories, realities and constrictions hip-hop has faced from within their own societies. The hip-hop nation as a transnational space of mutual learning and exchange may not have been a concrete reality, but the transient alliance, alliances that hip-hop has, hip has imagined across boundaries of class, race and nation gave them the resources and the platform they needed to tell their stories and provi provided the grounds for their locally based political actions. Global hip-hop was always marked by tension between the desire for transcendence and the need to speak directly to local realities. As hip-hop journalist Jeff Chang has said, the incongruous visions of Planet Rock and the message could only be brought together on the dance floor. The music held space as a possibility for unity and cross-cultural understanding that made it powerful. Yet the contradictions between the dual visions at, its, at the core of the culture would be replayed throughout global hip-hop history. From the late 80s b-boy craze to the corny appeal of MC Hammer, the militant postures of Public Enemy and the g-funk of Snoop Dogg, hip-hop culture has always resonated with youth across the world. Whether through multinational entertainment networks, underground record labels or the passing of mixtapes, young people of varied backgrounds have come particip to participate in this culture which originated among poor blacks and Latinos in the South Bronx. What are the reasons for the global spread of hip-hop? What accounts for the enduring appeal of the culture to such diverse youth populations? Is global hip-hop purely imitation or has it developed roots in global contexts? Hip-hop became global through both the commodification of hip-hop culture and what dance scholar Halifu Osumari calls connectivities based on culture, class, historical oppression and youth rebellion. Osumari argues that hip-hop's considerable appeal is based on an Africanist aesthetic that includes complex rhythmic timing, rhetorical strategies, and multiple layers of meaning. Hip-hop is the contemporary manifestation of an African-based expressivity of dance and music that empowers local youth and subverts dominant orders. From its inception, hip-hop culture has always been hybrid and diasporic. Several people have documented the participation of Puerto Ricans and Afro-Caribbeans. But that hybridity is still largely informed by the black American experience and dialogue among Afro-descendant Afro communities across the Americas. African aesthetics have been a crucial framing tool for exploring diverse forms of marginality, even as local hip-hop scenes draw on distinct historical experiences and cultural tropes in their adaptations of the form. But how is this different from, other, from earlier forms of black popular music like jazz or reggae that also went global? Hip-hop scholar S. Craig Watkins argues that the globalization of hip-hop is distinct from other cultural forms because it paralleled the rise of global media conglomerates. The size and scope of these conglomerates did not exist in the same way when jazz or rock and roll were first being marketed. Record companies such as Universal Music and Sony have packaged and sold hip-hop with an unparalleled intensity. 
As Chang has noted, more than 59 million rap albums were sold in the US in 2006, along with an estimated $10 billion worth of hip-hop related luxury and consumer items. Concepts such as marginality, blackness and the ghetto are themselves commodified and marketed by a multinational pop culture industry. The first wave of global hip-hop consisted last, largely of graffiti and the dance style of b-boying, or breakdancing as it's commonly known. Many global fans had their first glimpse of b-boying in the Hollywood blockbuster Flashdance, released in 1983. In one brief, brief scene of the film, Rocksteady crew members b-boy to Jimmy Castor's It's Just Begun. Over the next few years, Hollywood capitalised on the international success of Rocksteady's Flashdance cameo. They produced a string of what Chang calls teen-targeted hip-hop exploitation flicks, including Breakin', Beat Street, Body Rock, Fast Forward and Breakin' 2, Electric Boogaloo. These films served up a watered-down version of the culture, but they became some of the first hip-hop artifacts to circulate the globe. Through both legit and bootleg copies, aspiring b-boys and b-girls everywhere saw the, films, got out their cardboard, saw the films, got out their cardboard strips, and in schoolyards, train stops and street corners, they began to practice the moves. Many MCs had their start as b-boys or b-girls. Growing up in the 80s, the Cuban rap rapper Alexei from the rap duo Obsession was attracted by the raw energy and soul of the hip-hop music that came along the airwaves of 99 Jams FM. As a kid, he would build antennas from wire coat hangers and dangle his radio out the window, crazy to get the 99. On episodes of Soul Train that came through broadcast from Miami Television, Alexei saw b-boying for the first time and he copied the steps and then showed them to the kids in the neighborhood. Alexei remembered the dance ciphers in the park El Quijote. Kids would form a circle and in the center the b-boys would polish the concrete with their backspins and windmills while others broke into a beatbox or rhymed. Julio Cardenas, aka El Hip Hop Kid, was a rapper from the Alamar housing projects just outside of Havana. Julio was raised by his mother in the neighboring sector of Guanabacoa. As a kid, he would come rushing home from school to watch the b-boys retándose en retarse, meaning battling, and tirando cartones, or laying out the cardboard strip, on the back patio of his building. They watched Beat Street, Fast Forward, Breakin', and copied the moves. Julio moved to Alamar at the age of 15, becoming caught up in the hip-hop movement that was taking Alamar by storm. He would go to the moños, or block parties, where people rapped and DJed. After Julio finished school, he went on to technical college to do a degree in civil construction. But he graduated at the height of, Cuba's, of the crisis of Cuba's special period, when there were no jobs. And so he went to work with his grandfather in a nearby fishery for some cash to help out his mother and to get the local authorities off his back. Eventually, he found a job as a bridge operator, raising and lowering the bridge that connected Alamar and Kohima to allow the ships to pass through. The job was a no-brainer. At 7 a.m., Julio would raise the bridge, and by early afternoon, when all the boats had gone through, he would sit back with his friends, exchanging news about who had the latest rap magazine from the States, had they heard this song from Farside or e EMPD. In 96, Julio formed the, the group Raperos Crazy de Alamar, or RSA, along with Carlito Melito, a, carpen a carpenter, and Juan. They started out just to amuse themselves, without ambitions of being serious artists. That moment we were living was so critical, so boring, related Julio. Everything was closed off and censored. We, the youth, were just doing hip hop just to do something, looking for a way of having fun. The rap scholar Trisha Rose identified this need to break the cycle of boredom and alienation as one of the factors that underlay the rise of hip hop in the Bronx. While Cuba pre presented quite specific conditions of economic crisis combined with political restrictions, this void wasn't something peculiar to Cuba. For Monkey Muck, an Aboriginal hip hop producer in Sydney's West Side, it also started in 1984 with Beat Street. Jigging school, getting some money, and going and watching Beat Street every day because I wanted to see how they did all those windmills and all those mad moves, he said. First time you saw it, it was like, whoa, wait a second, I want to do that, man. That looks pretty cool. So next day I'm back at the cinema again. Next day I'm back there again. It's like a religion going there every day to watch Beat Street. He and some friends started going to inner city Redfern, a densely populated Aboriginal enclave where some of the local kids were b-boying. Later they also joined a local graffiti crew from Redfern called Black Connection. From b-boying and graffiti, Monkey Muck began rapping and he started the group SWS in 1992. 
I wasn't that interested in school, he said. For English class, I was in the English as a second, I was in the English as a second language group when English was my first language. The only class that I ever did good in was art, so I hardly ever bothered turning up to school. The people in our crew were not really school goers. So we started hanging out from there, and the hip-hop evolved from that. It broke the boredom. From the Alamar projects to Sydney's west side, hip-hop was a way out of the boredom. It wasn't the same boredom of kids in the suburbs wanting reprieve from their sheltered existence. It was the boredom of low-paying menial jobs and truncated opportunities. And hip-hop wasn't just a distraction from the void, it was, a re it was a way of recreating a sense of community and finding spaces of pleasure in the face of atomization, isolation, and the regimentation of life. Others, like the Aboriginal performer Wayata Telfer, remembers her involvement in the predominantly male culture of b-boying as a way of escaping the violence and unhappiness of her life. Wayata was captivated by b-boy culture. She and her little brother would watch Breakdance, Beat Street, and Electric Boogaloo on an old Betamax machine, and they'd try to copy the moves. When she was 13, Wayata had a dance crew with her brother and another boy, and they carried around their cardboard strip everywhere they went. I used to spin on my back and do the worm, she remembered. As usual, the boys used to do all the power moves. My brother would do the windmills, and I'd be there doing the moonwalk and the robot. I remember I wanted to be just like Baby Love from the Rocksteady crew, BB boys and BB girls all around the world. It was about sharing a message and also having some fun, dancing and having a good time. I'd grown up in a household where there was just a lot of violence and exposure to criminal activity because of poverty, she said. So for me, music was a way to escape, really, and have a sense of happiness because the life I was growing up in had some pretty hard elements. By the, by the mid-1980s, the elements of graffiti and b-boying were in decline, and rap emerged as a central means by which hip-hop culture was packaged for global consumption. At this time, rap movements also began to develop in various countries. Young people rhymed on street corners using a human beatbox. As more serious rap crews began to develop, they realized that they needed background beats, which often required expensive equipment. But like their Bronx, Bronx counterparts who developed the sound system from abandoned car radios and made turntable mixes from microphone mixers, global hip hoppers adapted materials from their local environment. The Lebanese Australian rapper Khaled Sabsabi turned his parents' garage into a music studio, making beats with basic analog methods. Khaled's first piece of equipment was a four track tape recorder that allowed him to record four tracks on a quarter inch cassette by combining sides A and B and splitting the left and right channels. He found the breakbeat that he wanted to use, recorded it on track one, and manually looped it by, manually looped it by inserting it over and over. A one bar sample of two seconds would need to be looped 90 times. It took almost a week to lay down a three minute beat. This was a fairly common experience for local producers who didn't have digital technology, and that's compared to something that would take you five minutes to do now. Coming from poor communities without access to art schools or music lessons, hip-hop producers often had to teach themselves how to produce music. Monkey Muck listened to a lot of old funk records. He listened to the Bootsy Collins bass lines and worked out how to play them. I had to figure out how do you put this stuff together, Monkey Muck said. No one told me. It was all trial and error, pulling apart tracks and figuring out, hold on, there's a bass line and a guitar part, a keyboard part singing. How does it all work? I taught myself guitar, keyboards, and then started figuring out how to put it all together. He got loans from his brother who was working at a scrap metal yard to buy a sequencer and a role in DJ70 sampler. Likewise, DJ Precise from Chicago Southside had an older brother, Jesus, who was a car mechanic and he and Precise mastered the inner machinery of their turntables by taking them apart and putting them back together. Cuban rappers lacked samplers, mixes and albums because of the US embargo against Cuba. Cuba's first hip-hop DJ, Ariel Fernandez, improvised a set of turntables with Walkmans as the decks, simulating a mixer by using volume controls. Producers drew on a rich heritage of Afro-Cuban music and Afro-diasporic instruments to make their beats. They recreated the rhythmic pulse of hip-hop with instruments like the melodic bata drums. In the heavily Afro-Cuban influenced eastern, eastern provinces, the group Madera Limpia rapped live with an entire ensemble of Cuban instruments. The group Obsesión used instrumentation to evoke the era of slavery. In their song Mambi, the gentle strumming of a berimbau, a string instrument associated with Afro-Brazilian capoeira, and the water sounds produced by the, by the traditional palo de agua, give the sense of being near a river or a stream identified with the rural roots of slaves.
Desencadena fuegos artificiales Desde que sabe que también merece papeles protagónicos es lógico. Quien me escucha ya es parte de un momento histórico Único. Porque tengo propósitos revolucionarios Hip hop culture drew on black aesthetics and a language of black, black brotherhood To forge solidarities between black and afro-descendant youth across the globe When American rappers visited Cuba They were met with a sense of great expectation and enthusiasm their language of black nationalism resonated with Cuban youth feeling the effects of racial discrimination as their once radical leaders pursued policies of austerity. Cuban MC Secu Omoja from Anonimo Consejo told me, we had the same vision as rappers such as Paris, who was one of the first to come to Cuba. His music drew my attention because here is something from the barrio, something black, of blacks and made principally by blacks, which in a short time became something very much our own, related to our lives here in Cuba. The American rapper Common organized a meeting with local rappers where they exchanged ideas and stories. The Black August Network brought equipments and records for the Cuban rappers. Like the African American activists who visited Cuba during the 1960s and 70s, from Stokely Carmichael through to Angela Davis and Asada Shakur, African American rappers such as Paris, Common, Most Def, and Talib Kweli spoke a language of black militancy that was appealing to Cuban youth. While a black radical such as Marcus Garvey enjoyed less support amongst, Afro amongst Afro-Cubans in the 1920s, the black nationalist aspirations of African-American rappers were received with considerably more enthusiasm by a population of Afro-Cuban youth increasingly feeling the effects of racial discrimination in the post-Soviet period. The song Tengo by the, by the group Hermanos de Causa presents the resurgence of racism in the contemporary period in striking contrast to the post-revolutionary euphoria of Afro-Cubans who saw in the Cuban Revolution the possibilities of an end to racial discrimination. Borrowing, borrowing the title and format of a 1964 poem by celebrated Afro-Cuban poet Nicolas Guillén, where the poet lists the changes that the revolution has brought for blacks, Hermanos de Causa instead described the situation in the contemporary post-Soviet period. Tengo una raza oscura y discriminada Tengo una jornada que me exige y no da nada Tengo tantas cosas que no puedo ni tocarlas Tengo instalaciones que no puedo ni pisarlas Tengo libertad entre un paréntesis de hierro Tengo tantos derechos sin provechos que me encierro Tengo lo que tengo sin tener lo que he tenido Tienes que reflexionar y asimilar el contenido Cuban rappers were reintroducing a lexicon of race and racism that had been abandoned for many years because the revolution had supposedly resolved issues of racism. Rap music became a voice for black Cuban youth who did not live through the early period of revolutionary triumph and were hardest hit by the failure of institutions established under the revolution to provide racial equality in the contemporary period. In Sydney, Wyatta Telfer also found a language for talking about local race relations through black music. It was on the music show Countdown that she first saw Bob Marley and she begged her mother to, to, take, to take her to see him on his survival tour of Australia and New Zealand in 1979. Like many other young indigenous Australians, Wyatta was drawn to Marley's pan-Africanist invocations of black brotherhood. Just a few years later, it was rap that caught her attention on the same show. When I saw Grandmaster Flash and Mel Mel with the message, I was in grade six or seven and I was really blown away, recalled Wyatta. One was for the rhyming. I'd never seen that or heard that before. And two, for what he was saying. It hit home, really political stuff coming from another person who was black. Aboriginal people didn't live in ghettos in South Australia. They were dispersed into white society. But the song resonated. It was not always the rap lyrics that created a sense of affinity between black youth across the globe, especially in places where English was not understood. The Venezuelan gangster rappers, Guerrilla Seca and Vagos in, Ma and Vagos in oops, and and Vagos y Maliantes were influenced by American rappers like Tupac, Nas, and Ludacris. They couldn't understand the English lyrics, but they said that there was a certain flow, a feeling associated with the music that spoke to them. We can see this echoed in the song Boca del Lobo, Mouth of the Wolf, by the group Vagos y Maliantes. No, 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 no,
la boca del lobo Donde menos de un segundo aquí puede pasar de todo Muertes, atracos, lo que se vive a diario en mi barrio Día y noche, noche y día Coming from the poor barrios of Caracas, they found that the bleakness and despondency of the music echoed the deteriorated social fabric of their lives. Likewise, Julio Cardenas in Cuba was listening to American rap, but he didn't understand the lyrics and had no clue how to write his own songs. One day, Julio was at Pablo's house, uh, rap producer Pablo Herrera's house, listening to his latest music. He heard a song, Boricuas on the Set, by Fat Joe, featured on a compilation album. Hearing the song was a turning point in his life. Coñota buena, I said when I heard it, Julio related. It was a moment that touched my heart and opened my mind. I was hearing a lot of music from Miami Radio, LL Cool J, Two Life Crew, Queen Latifah, Moni Love, but that song inspired me. I thought it could really be the Latino-American Cuban connection. Pablo copied Fat Joe's song for Julio on a cassette. Julio would li listen to the poor quality recording on his old beat-up Walkman over and over every day. I liked the beat, but I didn't know what to do, said Julio. I didn't know anything about flow, cadence, rhythm. I'd never studied music. Wow, how am I going to do it? At the start, it was all a joke. But every day, I began to think of a vision about how I wanted to do the song. What was guiding me was the sound of the voices, the mixture of each, and the cadences. I started to rap over the top of the song, write my first lyrics. So when Fat Joe said, oh Boricuas, clap your hands, I started saying, todo el mundo con los manos arriba, negros mulatos blancos. That was the basis of my first rap, Hip Hop Es Mi Cultura. It was an old school rap, but it reached the people. But while global hip hop followers found strong connections to American hip hop, attempts to come together in global alliances revealed the fractures that existed. The pain of racism may have been the bridge that connected the American rappers with those in the diaspora, but that racism took a different form in each context, the Black August Hip Hop Collective encountered during their trip to Cuba. As described in the opening to this talk at the Cuban Hip Hop Festival, Dead Prez burned a dollar bill as a symbol of American capitalism, horrifying local audiences who saw it as a week's worth of bread. The Cubans had anticipated the concerts of the Black August rappers with much emotion and excitement, but inexplicably, during the performance of the pioneer American rapper Most Deaf, people started leaving the stadium. Reyes de la Calle are much better than Most Deaf, said some kids on their way out. We can't understand anything he says. The attempt to foster cultural exchange and understanding drew claims of cultural imperialism from local MCs. Some local rappers saw a gap between the politically committed lyrics of the Black August rappers and their actions. As So Andri of Hermano Secosa told the filmmaker Vanessa Diaz, it's not saying it, it's not singing it, it's showing it. To me, none of these people, not Dead Prez, not Common Sense, not Most Deaf, have shown me anything. They just say what they say in their songs, but they don't represent that. So Andrew was bitter about the various, various rap collaborations done between visiting American rappers and Cuban rappers. The resulting productions tended to make money for the American artists, but not for the Cubans. Cuban rappers were getting tired of the one-way stream of Westerners treating their local scenes as exotic cultures to be packaged for the consumption of Western audiences. The Latino-American Cuban connection was somewhat tenuous when subjected to the very real differences of language, culture, and history. The black militancy of the American rappers was not always comparable to the racial consciousness of Cuban rappers. Black Cuban identity, always expressed within the boundaries of an anti-colonial nationalism, was not equ equivalent to American blackness shaped through the fiery battles of abolition, desegregation, and civil rights. Cubans didn't have a civil rights movement that brought a discussion of race out into the open. The black-white dichotomy of American race relations did not exist in Cuba. While in America even one drop of black blood characterized a person as black, Cubans had a much broader spectrum of race, racial classifications, from the darker-skinned prietos, morenos, and negros, to the mixed-race pardos and mulatos. The militant stance of the American rappers appealed to the Cubans, particularly with its language of racial justice, but the categories of American racial politics could not be superimposed onto a culture where racial identity was not so clear cut. At its best, hip hop could create strength through recognizing the parallel lines of oppression that existed across cultures. At its worst, it appeared as, a, as an American export that encouraged mindless imitation and imposed one narrative of race over another. Even the idea of a brotherhood that hip hop has imagined across cultures contained its own dynamics of gendered exclusion. When male hip-hoppers bonded over a DJ battle or exchanged fist bumps on a street corner, 
there was a sense of masculine camaraderie that left women looking on from the sidelines. Open mics and freestyle battles rarely had women participants. When women did take the mic, it was often with a different kind of presence, as expressed in this song Mujeres by the Cuban rapper Mariana. Yo me nombro protagonista, pero en la pista y no en la cama, como muchas que prefieren ir de rapero en rapero para coger fama. Yo, Mariana, hago demostrar al mundo que la mujer cubana no solo sabe mover sus caderas, sino cuando se hable de hip hop somos de las primeras, las realistas, aunque seamos discriminadas por conceptos machistas. Black women rappers frequently talk about their exclusion within hip hop culture. While male rappers speak about historical problems of slavery and marginality, black women must face forms of marginalization from males themselves. The Cuban trio Las Crudas point to machismo as an identical system of slavery for women. Just as male rappers point to the exclusion of rap from major media programming, venues and state institutions, in their song Eres Bella, Las Crudas challenge male rappers for their exclusion of women. I have talent and I ask how long will we be the minority on stage? Even if the global hip-hop hood was more fantasy than actuality, maybe the lines of solidarity that hip-hoppers were looking for could be found in the diaspora. As global hip-hop began to come of age, hip-hoppers found themselves increasingly torn between the need to make a living and the desire to pursue their art. With record labels picking off a, f a scant few to sign and promote, the rest were left to wonder in what direction their lives were headed. For many, pursuing a career in music meant leaving the comfort of their local scenes and heading to the West. Local superstars in Brazil or Kenya became busboys in New York or taxi drivers in London in order to pursue their dreams. As hip-hoppers started to move across the globe, they developed new understandings of themselves and others that helped to break down some of the misconceptions that had plagued global hip-hop. The diaspora was a base from which hip-hoppers could create broader global networks and build multiracial solidarities. In some cases, this was a result of hip-hop artists emigrating from their homelands, usually to Western countries such as the US or Britain. Cuban rappers in particular began to emigrate after 2005. Julio was one of sev the first of several rappers to leave Cuba. He had stayed on in New York after participating in the first US tour of Cuban rappers, actually soon after 9-11. Sleeping in a room the size of a closet in the cold of the bitter New York winter, he wondered whether he had made the right decision. He was not an athlete or a professional musician with a future in the US or even someone with family in the States to look out for him. He was poor and black, one of the stars of a movement that came up from nothing. But Julio's encounter with Latino artists in the metropolis provided the ground for new collaborations. Julio co-wrote a play, Representa, with Latino poet Paul Flores that dramatizes the dissonance they feel in each other's spaces. They are both minorities, but Flores is seen as the rich tourist in Havana while Cardenas has the privileges of education, healthcare, and social mobility under the Cuban Revolution that are not available to marginalized Latinos. The Latino-American Cuban connection that Julio first imagined when he heard Boricuas on the set seemed to have a better chance of being realized when Cubans and Latinos could live in each other's spaces and acknowledge their differences. The story of the global spread of hip hop is itself one of movement a movement of ideas, a movement of commodities, a movement of people. If there is anything that marks this move moment, it is as much the motion and mobility that connect people as it is the boundaries and borders that divide. Hip hop is a force defined by rupture and flow, and it remains to be seen whether global hip hoppers can reinvent themselves in the diaspora and build enduring links with their homeland. begin the, uh, the Chicago chapter by saying that's kind of where I landed up when I landed in the US. Um, I, went to, I went to the University of Chicago and then um, the people that I met were of course much further south than the, than, the, than the University of Chicago and to me it was striking, it was the first time I was coming directly from Sydney, Australia to the US and this was the first thing that I encountered was extreme segregation between the privileged world of the university and its immediate environs and then all the world much further south of 
um, of the university and and I think that was something that really struck me was seeing and, and Chicago itself is a very segregated city but um, I guess coming from a different context where you don't openly see that kind of uh, segregation was just really were really shocking to me and so um, that 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 chapter really talks about how you know I went from that particular situation even trying to find uh, you know uh, looking for rappers and looking for hip-hop culture within the university where of course uh, whenever the administration would bring any rap groups onto campus it was always heavily under surveillance and with um, you know as if rap music is something different to any other culture that they'll bring onto the campus and of course trying to keep out the local community which is um, a big part of the university's development policies um, and and so uh, actually I ended up connecting with with rappers and rap groups um, who lived in the Hyde Park area of the university but were part of the more long-term communities and so um, just learning about you know the, the whole history of, of how hip hop developed in Chicago, and also to some extent um, uh, looking at its continuity with earlier forms. So, so Chicago is of course known for the blues and known for house music, and um, and these two forms you know did have more resonance within the South Side communities. But what happened with hip hop was as deindustrialization hit the South Side, and all of the um, you know people had to leave because they couldn't get jobs in. Um, uh, in the area and as, as there was sort of white flight from the area most of the entertainment venues move from the south side to the north side and so much of that chapter also looks at this struggle of, of hip hoppers in the city to have spaces to do their music because there's not really spaces within um, uh, the sort of cultural wastelands which is where you know a lot of them are living but at the same time they're prevented from um, performing in the north side venues so yeah. How often feel like discussions in the U.S. revolve around the dichotomy between conscious or, or socially responsible hip-hop and more commercialized uh, forms of the art. And I wonder if you can speak to that dichotomy, either within the U.S. or especially interested to a degree that holds up outside the borders of the U.S. And I noticed that the, the only example you gave that might have been seen as not socially conscious mm -hmm. was the Boca de Lobos, mm -hmm. but even there, the song that you gave us was actually, you know, a fairly rich with social commentary. Mm -hmm. So, it, are there examples of popular hip hop artists in, you know, in Venezuela or in, in Cuba who are really rapping primarily about wealth and mm -hmm. status, or is mm -hmm. that less common? Well, I mean, one of the things that, that I do in the book is to sort of say, uh, differentiate between. The diversity of hip-hop, which from its start in um, the 70s and 80s, addressed all kinds of things. It talked about partying, it talked about politics, it talked about many different kinds of things. And, and, what, and it was also commercial from the beginning. So I think some people pose a dichotomy between hip-hop as original roots, which was really political, and then later it became commercialized and kind of somehow taken over by record companies, which is untrue because from the very first Sugar Hill Gang, the, uh, the early days of hip hop, it was um, commercial and it was commercialized, and this is how hip hop went around the globe. So, I disagree with those analyses of global hip hop that say, well, somehow global in the global realm, you see a much um, a much more political form of hip hop that doesn't exist here. Because I think that um, in the narrative that I kind of lay out in the book is more one where what has happened is that um, in the the sort of ever since the Telecommunications Act of 1996, what we've seen is a, 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 a hip hop becoming more corporate, what Jeff Chang calls corporate rap. And I think that's something that we can definitely point to is that you have the same old themes, the same old repetitious kind of um, music heard on the radio because there are not really many other avenues for underground artists within the US to have their music heard. It's really only the people who have the money through payola to get their songs on the radio here. So that's the kind of dichotomy I do think exists now, I think, between the, the early, the original first few decades of, his, of, of hip hop in the US and its richness and diversity versus what you hear on the radio now, which is, to me, a lot less diverse than what you hear. So that's, that, that's just to answer that part of the question. Then the other part about, you've mentioned about Garia Seca and Vagos y Maliantes, this is something um, that I thought a lot about after doing my work in Venezuela because I, after going to Cuba and sort of medium, you heard some of the lyrics, the sort of revolutionary hip hop artists and going to Venezuela, I thought I would encounter more of that kind of music, especially given the sort of state of heightened political mobilization in the country. 
And what I encountered was gangster rappers being this really strong kind of current within the country. And, and, and it was really by talking to people and listening to the music and, and realizing again that they uh, really had some kind of, um, I mean, they really went back to the early days of gangster rap here in the United States as well, which again was taking on political concerns, was rapping about wealth and rapping about money because they felt that, like the, the, what the people in Venice, the gangster rappers in Venezuela said to me is, we're poor, we come from a poor background, we've never had any of this kind of thing, this is why we rap about it, and also because we want to orient our conversation to where people are at, and this is why this is where we begin with. Um, and so, you know, it was, it was really interesting for me to see this, this gap between, on the one hand, the Chavistas and, and some of the rappers who tried to, you know, take on this, this really polit highly politicized mode of rapping and, and, and use a political language, and then the gangster rappers, who often is just narratives of life, life in the barrio, um, biographies of who they were, where they came from. Um, this, was, this is the kind of thing that they were doing. And so for me, in the global context, I think many of these gangster rappers that I came across were trying to come back to the early days of what they saw as gangster rap in the US as maintaining some kind of stance, whether political or whatever you might call it, but um, as compared to the sort of um, almost one-dimensional um, just uh, um, obsession with wealth and gaining wealth that, that people that you would see in the later part um, of corporate rap. So yeah. I'm curious about how hip hop maintains an association with poverty and marginalization when a lot of people may encounter it as coming from a place of wealth and power, particularly thinking about places like India, Singapore, and Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. It seems that there are locations in which hip hop is associated with being very bourgeois mm -hmm. and sort of connected to foreignness with a different sort of meaning. And so mm -hmm. I'm wondering what other ways of understanding music and discourses about race have to be there for hip hop to be interpretable as about being black as opposed to about the US or global connection of a different sort? Mm -hmm. Well, that's, I mean, I, my parents are from India and when I uh, went back there, I remember seeing the very first thing, uh, time I ever came across hip hop was a DJ battle in the Taj Hotel, which is one of the like, most wealthiest hotels in, um, in, this, in, in Delhi. And, I was just thinking, I mean, it was just really amazing to me to think how something that, especially in Australia, which is where I'd come across people there, it was always out in, um, out in the West, which is a much poorer immigrant um, and Aboriginal areas of the city, to come to India and see it in a very, you know, a hotel where you probably have to pay $40 to get in, and clearly it was only kids with, with a lot of money who could even get in there and see that, that battle. So I think, um, I mean, this has always been a tension within global hip hop. I think in all places and, and, and you know, it's, it's been uh, often people who had family abroad, who could bring in the latest music, who had access to it. So I, I don't think it's true that, you know, we can't necessarily say that hip hop necessarily went from one marginalized community to another and that's how it spread across the globe was always through poor people. I don't think that's true. I think often it, um, it did spread through the commoditization of hip hop through these channels of, of wealth and privilege. and. Um, and then in different ways, you know, depending on specific histories, it sort of filtered down. And in the Venezuela chapter, I actually look at one of the main figures in Venezuelan um, hip-hop, who's a DJ called DJ Trece, who grew up because his mother was doing a PhD at NYU, and he grew up in the, in the, in the village, and, and that's where he heard hip-hop. And, um, and he's quite an interesting character because he's, you know, in the interview he says, I'm the one responsible for hip-hop in Venezuela, I invented it here. It's only because of me that people know about it. And yet, in all the other interviews I did, there were people saying back in the 80s, you know, we heard Run DMC, we heard this, with this as we were, uh, we were already b-boying. And yet, there's this attempt to kind of rewrite, you know, the history. And, and, and I find this in many places where people, particularly people with privilege, who have had that kind of access either because they were able to come to the US or they had relatives who say, you know, we're the ones that brought hip hop here because you know, we know all about it. These kids from the barrio, how would they've never been to the US? They haven't been to New York, you know, the Mecca, of course. They've never been there, whereas I live there and grew up there. So I was always finding these kind of, um, these kind of disjunctures. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to know if you address in your book how um, the uh, evolution of the internet and internet hip hop mm -hmm. has changed this, you know, the global aspects of hip hop. Um, because I feel that uh, uh, 
hip hop isn't just a thing that it's not the radio anymore. It's right. not, you know, your cassette tapes and stuff like that. It's, you know, the exchange over the internet. You know, nobody's mm -hmm. really focused on, you know, their album. They're focused on their mixtape and getting people interested in buying yeah. an album. So um, I was just wondering how that changed yeah. the culture. I mean, that's fascinating, and that's a, a totally different book. Um, I began, the, the narrative for this book begins in 1995, and um, it goes through to 2006. And so, for instance, in Chicago, uh, one, of the, one of the characters that I look at, Mike Treese, this rapper who um, is trying to sell his albums and he's trying to sell his mixtapes, he says one of the main reasons he could sell so many at that time was because um, people couldn't get music off the internet because the only way that they could get it was he would buy the albums and he would copy the songs onto his mixtape and that's how he could sell it because people had no other way of getting the music. Now that people can get music through all kinds of other ways, it's actually harder to sell mixtapes. Um, and, and just uh, uh, for people who might not know, mixtape is what a lot of underground artists will do because um, you know they don't have any way of getting their music released is they will produce their own albums and they don't have really any way of selling their own music because nobody's going to pay for a whole album with just your songs on it if they don't really know you. They'll put one or two of their own tracks together with a whole lot of other tracks and call it a mixtape and they'll sell it, um, which is something that the early DJs used to do as a way of distributing their music. And um, so this is what these, um, uh, these guys do. So, so what's interesting is that the internet has changed all of that and in some ways made it harder for these artists to distribute their music because um, they're competing now with the internet, but of course, in the same, and on, on the other hand, it has created a whole lot of other avenues for them to get their media, to get their music out. And S. Craig Watkins actually refers to what he calls the digital underground. Um, if you're interested, in he, his book is is pretty good um, on that, the digital underground about uh, this whole new sort of alternative public space through which um, music is available, precisely because the telecommunications act and the um, monopoly that. Um, clear channel communications and just a few uh, monopolies hold on uh, the, over the radios has really restricted what music can be heard there. Um, do you think that hip hop still has or deserves a place within the conversation of civil rights in the US, especially considering groups like Odd Future that, just, that don't just talk about status and power, but also talk about raping women and other you know, killing people and lots of other crimes? I think given um, the continuing popularity of hip hop and given how many records it, it sells and which, you know, some people would argue that ever since hip hop has become corporate, it's mostly selling records among white suburban um, consumers. Um, but I think that it definitely, whether or not you would see it as part of a sort of more politicized struggle or, whether, or, or civil rights or, or um, that kind of thing in general, I think it has to be a part of some conversation to address because, and, and, and also because there are people who, you know, the whole idea of underground hip hop is something that takes off also in the late 1990s as, as hip hop is moving in this more corporate direction. Underground hip hop really does um, become uh, an important voice for people who are critical of that more one dimensional kind of um, current. And I think, uh, you know, to engage in dialogue about that, I think is important. I think you spoke about this in the um, particularly like in a quote from Solandri talking about how we hadn't learned anything from mm. that present others. I was wondering other instances of a sort of backlash against New York or the America and the broader by artists who were maybe initially inspired by that but then decide to you know, react against it. Yeah, well, that, I mean, that's something that happened particularly after Black August and um, all of the, uh, the the tours that Black August, so all the artists that I mentioned, the American rappers, were part of these Black August uh, uh, collectives who went to Cuba, then they later went to South Africa. And what's really interesting to me is the same criticisms come up from both Cuba and South Africa of their encounters with the American artists and the way that, you know, they treated the, a, a South African artist who is one of the, the sort of top artists in the country, you know, the, the American artists just treat him like their driver. And, and just this sense that, you know, they've put all this energy and emotion into bringing out the American artists and, and, and not really treated with the same respect and on equal terms as those artists. And then um, just, I mean, all kinds of other things like the um, Dead Prez not really putting um, a picture of South African women on the cover of their Let's Get Free album and saying, you know, this is from um, the Soweto uprising when really it's from the independence movement. Like not really having these same cliched notions of Africanness that you would expect someone 
with their level of political knowledge not to fall into and yet sort of having that. So I think this is on, on these kind of levels the criticisms were coming from and, and that's not to say there weren't positive elements like I think I talked about in the talk the ways that there were these grassroots exchanges and discussions but at the same time I think people actually meeting the artists there were ways in which um, you know both the Cuban and the South African artists and, I, and I've talked to you know I worked in the context of Cuba I haven't um, been to South Africa but talking to South African artists um, and hearing their stories, it's interesting to me how much, how many parallels there are um, with the Cuban ones. And and then what's interesting is how, at this certain point, um, there was a Venezuelan filmmaker called Juan Carlos Echeandia who decided to make a film about American hip hop. And he came here and he started interviewing all of these people in New York City. And I just I thought that was interesting because it's 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 always, you know, Americans go overseas to make films or, or to write about global hip-hop. It's not that people from abroad come to America to write about American hip-hop. It's like, why would we need you to come here and tell us? But yet he made this film and he wrote and he, and he interviewed a lot of people here. He went back to Venezuela, interviewed people there. And to me, that point was kind of interesting because it was like, well, there are other people who can tell this narrative and tell this story from their location. Um, so, sorry, yeah. Uh, one question. Uh, you know that we find that uh, about this country, how change that rap on hip hop, uh, and what it means about hip hop. Um, for me, I love Tupac, and mm -hmm. I'm a third of PSG when they start doing hip hop. But now it's all commercial. Mm -hmm. It's about, I mean, you see in MTV, Morning, Woman, uh, Car, and that's it. Mm -hmm. and they, they don't say nothing. But they say, oh, yeah, I grew from the street. Yeah, but you live now, you, you don't live there, you, uh, you live in LA, in Beverly Hills. Right? Mm -hmm. So, I know in Buenos Aires, because I'm from Buenos Aires, mm -hmm. I'm from, from mm -hmm. Caracas. And at the first time when I heard from Sandy Papo, when the movie uh, Huele Pega, when Carlos Andres Perez was the mm -hmm. president, but when they, they showed that portrait about what, what is happening and, and the reality. So, I think that it's very Whatever people see or, or write is about is about how is the life. I mean, for example, Chavez. Mm -hmm. I know they have no a lot of support for the poor people, so that's why all that song is again to to the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, not really to the people who really, you know, people who like the power, right? You know, like the time Bush and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So they, you know, that they mix that like. Uh, uh, now they have more power because it's coming from the poor people. You know, mm -hmm. it, it's that popularity that we talk about. And I think when it's a group is called uh, Dame Para pa mm -hmm. Matarla. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's amazing. They talk mm -hmm. about, I mean, and they talk, oh, they are from Chavez because they talk mm -hmm. about, again, to, to, to the United But no, you know, like that. They really talk about the reality. And it's a good, it's, it's amazing. It's, one kid and two guys, and mm -hmm. they use all the folklore instrument. Mm -hmm. They don't use like a, you know, like an instrument. But my question is, if you see like in this country, how changed the change the hip hop mm -hmm. like like before the eighties, and uh, it's like salsa. Salsa is like it's like Hector Labo when when they mm -hmm. go, it's, it's mm -hmm. about the street. Salsa Brava. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. So they know about oh, you know, like oh, I come from here, so you know, it, it's, it's not easy. And uh, he's from Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. he's like he from here also. So you see a difference, like they and in Venezuela they are no more famous hip hop singer. Mm -hmm. Only they start with Sandy Papo that I remember and then they they have some guy that they're trying to see but they no mix like here, you know. But they change everything. So I think that it's all everything that they start singing is about what situation it is being right now. No matter what, if you're poor or not, because that one's clear. I love Eminem, and Eminem is white. Mm -hmm. And his song is amazing, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, we go, oh, I'm black, so I have to sing. No, 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 it's not changed at all. It's open, all the mm -hmm. stereotypes, you know, about. So that's why, if you see that, you know, only me, it means it's a different about before and after. Mm -hmm. But one thing that was, I mean, the, when I was in Venezuela, it really made me think about this link between music and politics and how, I mean, there's always this idea that, well, you know, when there's a political movement, it can really help drive the music into new directions. And, and, and in, in some ways in Venezuela, I saw the opposite when I was there. I mean, in years afterwards, I think that that's, you know, that's probably changed somewhat. But I remember, um, 
I, I mean, the, the two groups that I talked about, Vagos y Maliantes and Guerilla Seca, I, I was just fascinated by their music and it was really interesting. And then all of these Chavista rap groups started coming onto the scene and, and, and to me there wasn't a whole lot of music in what they were doing and it's, it's like, you know, you can have something that politically sounds good but musically um, doesn't have a lot of soul in it or just doesn't have... Um, and, and that was a problem that I was finding and, and I remember talking to Cuban rappers who came at that time and they were saying it can almost be too much when you know there's all of a sudden this real you know push to develop new kinds of groups and the government's giving a whole lot of funding towards you know sponsoring gatherings and concerts and music and it's almost too much because then all you see is this kind of breed of new rappers coming out who are all sort of saying the same thing and, and um, and it's not developing organically in the same way as, say, Cuban rap did, right? Which was on the margins, not necessarily with state support when it when when it started at the beginning. Um. This is more an observation. Um, I did, you know, like, obviously, you have all these different folks in different parts of the world, and one thing that is uniting them is uh, Africanness or a claim to Africanness. Mm -hmm. But another thing that just you know, constantly boredom. Mm -hmm. uh, again and again, especially in those interviews where, where you're talking to people about the 80s mm -hmm. and people going and stuff going forward. I was like, I didn't count. There was like at least mm -hmm. four or five right. different people who were like, yeah, that was, it was boring. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. this came out again. So I was sort of the question. There's not really a question. It's like, how do you conceptualize boredom mm -hmm. in a way that can capture that? Because mm -hmm. it just seems to be such a compelling motivation behind this and its emergence, and there's a politics of boredom, mm -hmm. and an aesthetics of boredom, or maybe the, the reaction to it, you know, just that there's something compelling about it, that I, I was thinking to myself, well, I can conceptually, I've got, I've got plenty of sources I can go to think about Africanness, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I can see that boredom is kind of a harder thing to, to, um, to critically and politically kind of capture, so I was wondering to what extent you can maybe say a bit more about that, or, or no, and that fascinated me too, and I just remember going back over my material and, and just seeing this come out time and time again, and, and to me, there's really something that this is connected to the generational question, right? It's a generation that isn't necessarily straight from, um, from school into jobs. It's, it's a generation that is, <laughs> whether you're Cuba or whether you're in um, the south side of Chicago, whether you're in Sydney, you're facing deindustrialization, you're facing all of these, um, you know, this world that really... Uh, doesn't necessarily offer you jobs, doesn't necessarily offer you community and, and this is you know why like the, the projects and the places that did provide some sense or even um, uh, communities that were more cohesive as deindustrialization begins and people begin to to move and, and be displaced into different areas again structures of community and kinship begin to break down and so there's all these ways in which people are somewhat just afloat it, and it is a generational thing I think because the previous generation doesn't necessarily use words like boredom in the same way. It doesn't seem to be so kind of encompassing of their experience as it is for this generation um, where, I mean, you're right, it, it really did strike me as well as coming out. And, and, and like I said in the talk, it's not, I think there's a difference between saying, you know, bored kids in the suburbs who, um, you know, go on a shooting rampage because they're bored with their lives or, you know, whatever. I think there's a, there's a difference between that and the boredom that comes from from this kind of poverty and that comes from um, just lack of opportunities that, that you're going to graduate with a degree in civil engineering like Julio did and yet you're going to be raising a bridge every single day of your life you know because that's the only opportunity that's available to you. Um. Um, I was wondering if you could touch on um, the gender dimension a little bit more. I was really curious to see like if um, hip-hop artists like the other bar pop artists were like addressing um, the marginalization that would make hip-hop hip artists face um, and like, if it takes different forms, like the different places you uh, have to do your studies. I mean, it, what's interesting to me was um, was how in each of these places, like in Sydney, for instance, when I first uh, was a part of hip hop in in 1995, and um, it was amazing to me how uh, women became so involved in this culture right from the very beginning. There were so many of them, and, um, and I think that you could say the same of American hip hop. Uh, in um, Cuba as well, right from the beginning, there was, uh, as the years went on, there were more, but there was also something in which there was a lot of participation. And, and over the years, 
I think that women have found it a lot harder to sustain their participation within hip hop culture and, and you know I mentioned some of the factors that have made them feel kind of excluded or on the margins or just kind of you know uh, not part of this fraternity um, that they that they see but I, I mean in Australia for instance it's got to do with the, the way that that um, hip-hop was marketed so when it moved from the sort of local spaces and the parties and the um, the early jams into uh, the marketing of hip-hop by Australian record labels who wanted to market what they called Aussie rap and they said well if you want to be you know uh, if you want a record you have to speak in a really Australian accent um, and and you have to be white and male I mean the five main groups that were signed by Australian record labels were all well, all, my, all male, all white groups, and so this to me, there's a really big disjuncture between the the, the scene that I knew um, when I was growing up and what has emerged right now, where none of those people are involved in hip hop anymore. None of the women that I knew. So, so is there another question? I want to, before anybody else leaves, I want to do two things. First, to pitch, come to the waffle shop tonight at eight thirty. 8.30. 8.30. This is going to catch on fire uh, in, in another way uh, at, at the waffle shop. Um, anything more to add about that? Uh, yes. Free food. Free Venezuelan food. Uh, we're going to be having live discussion with some folks in different urban areas in Venezuela um, in connection with uh, Sujata's connections in Venezuela and uh, La Cocina Arepas, the third iteration of Conflict Kitchen, a takeout restaurant that serves cuisine from countries that the U.S. government is in conflict with. So please stop by. And the second thing is, if you have a $10 bill, do not burn it. It's <laughs> dated for this book. And that represents a 50% uh, reduction from the economic price. But, uh, there they are.